Yep, it's another frickin' laser, and we're gonna test it. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, if you've been around the channel for a while, then you'll remember about five months ago, I tested a blue diode laser that's able to directly mark stainless steel, but that really can't do much on other metals. Well, since that time, there's a new crop of Galvo fiber lasers on the market that do advertise the ability to directly mark mild steel and aluminum, and we're gonna test one of those today. The laser I'm testing today was provided to me by Adam Stack in exchange for making a review, which is something that I really appreciate. I love having the opportunity to try out new tools. However, my opinions on this particular product are mixed. We'll talk about it. The laser I'm testing today is the Adam Stack M4 Fiber Laser. It has a list price around $1,500. It's currently selling with a street price of about $1,400. It consists of two parts. There's the laser module on top and a stand underneath. This is what's called a Galvo laser, which means there are mirrors in here that scan the laser beam back and forth rapidly as it engraves the object that you have placed down on the platform underneath. Now, this particular laser has a removable section of the platform, so you can pull this out, set the whole laser on top of something to be engraved, and you can engrave through that opening. Now the stand is adjustable. There's a knob to raise and lower the laser to focus the beam on your workpiece. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit more later. And then there's a button here on the back that you can press to start the engraving process. And then on the end opposite the lens, we have the power connector for the power brick and USB, and of course the power switch to turn it on. To assist with focusing, there are two red lasers, one that comes out of the bottom here at an angle and one that comes through the lens, and you can raise and lower the laser itself until those spots meet. And when they meet, in theory, you are in focus. More about that in a bit. The laser is attached to the stand with a single thumb screw and some locating pins. You can see the lens here on the bottom and the secondary focusing laser. Now in theory, you can use this handheld and they provide a little shield for that purpose. So you can pick it up and engrave items that won't fit under it or vertical surfaces like furniture and walls or anything that you fancy. Now the benefit of a laser in this form factor, of course, is that it is small and portable and can be stored away easily. But of course the drawback is you have a relatively small working area of only 70 millimeters square. Compare that to the half a meter square that most of the blue diode lasers can manage. And uh, this is just a completely different animal designed for a completely different purpose. That's the marketing brief. Now let's talk about what I actually received. When the laser showed up, the lens was sticking out of the housing at a weird angle. This is probably just something that happened during shipping and I wanted to make sure I was giving it a fair review. So I contacted tech support. They told me that this is perfectly normal and will not affect the operation of the laser. Um, no, it definitely affects operation because it prevents the red guide lasers from meeting at the focus point, and it made it so that the guard wouldn't fit on properly. When I inquired further, they emailed me a cell phone video, all in Chinese, and asked if I could understand it. Sadly, no. I think it was something about adjusting the focus, which really didn't have anything to do with what I was asking, or maybe it did, I couldn't understand it. I reached out to my contact at the company and was told that the lens was probably just loose and that I could remove it and screw it back in. That also wasn't the case. The lens was solidly attached. It just wasn't straight. Since I wasn't getting any help from tech support, I decided that was basically permission to take it apart and try to fix it myself, which I did. Let's crack it open and I'll show you what I found. I actually kind of like the packaging here. The side is just held on with four screws and with those out, you can see the construction. At one end, we have the fiber laser module and a couple of fans to draw air across the heat sink for cooling. The laser beam then enters a sealed Galvo mirror and lens module that handles the scanning. Of course, when I opened this the first time, the whole module was tilted at an angle. If we flip it over, the other side was held on by those same screws through some long standoffs, so it just pulls right off and we can see a little bit more of the electronics. I just noticed this power jack is loose, so I might as well tighten that while I'm in here. You can see how I, quote, fixed it. I just jammed a screw wrapped in Kapton tape under the mirror module to support it at the correct angle. 
The whole assembly is mounted to an aluminum block and it's held to the case using two screws. If I loosen the screws, you can see that the mirror assembly is free to move and that's what happened during shipping. It just tilted down. There's actually a groove in the bottom of the case that's supposed to locate the mounting block, but it's too narrow so it doesn't fit properly and the screws just pull the module down at an angle. Hence the screw that I wedged in there. It's the first thing I could find that was the right size to get the correct alignment. Under this cover on the bottom, you can see how the angled focusing laser works. There are some set screws that hold the pivoting mount in place so you can just adjust the laser spots to meet once you've adjusted it to the proper focus height. Adjusting the focus height turned out to be a lot less trouble than I thought it was gonna be. I was thinking I would need to engrave like a fine grid pattern several times and adjust it up and down by trial and error, but it turns out it's way easier than that. All you have to do is listen. You can hear the hissing of the laser ablating material off the workpiece and you just have to turn the knob up and down until you find the point where it's the loudest. And then you can adjust your red dots to align and you're done. This is the software that comes with the M4 laser. It's called CCAD, though in some of the error messages and other places, it refers to itself as BSL CAD. So I suspect that this was repurposed from something else. This is just a basic CAD package for drawing artwork to burn with the laser. And honestly, there are a lot of features in here. I just don't know how to use them because there isn't any documentation. If we come up here to the help menu and go to the help document, we get the, in this case, it's calling itself BSL CAD, and it's just displaying an error message, I believe telling me that there is no document available. I have looked on their website, I have asked around, I, I, there doesn't appear to be documentation for this. In the printed manual that comes with the laser, there are a few screenshots and a little flow chart showing some of the basic operations and a half dozen settings. And that's pretty much all I've touched and I have gotten it to work. So if we just come over here, we can draw a rectangle and that is just a geometric object. We wanna fill that in. You can click here on fill and it brings up fill options. Now, the only thing I have touched in here is the line setting. This indicates how closely the lines should be spaced and the manual has a few recommendations in it for a few types of material and they range from like 0.05 millimeter down to 0.001 millimeter. And honestly, the recommendations in the manual didn't work out that well for me. I've just been figuring out how to do this and how to get the results I want by trial and error. So we'll set this to 0.01, click OK, and now you can see that is filled in. Now when we go to burn it, over here on this side are the settings. There are two that you need to touch. There's the speed and the power. I have never found a reason to set the power at less than 100%. The speed just indicates how much energy is put into any particular area. So I've, in some cases, had to go as low as 100 millimeters per second to burn in like titanium and mild steel, and as high as 1,000 or even 1,500 millimeters per second when just trying to blow the paint off of something. So getting a good result comes down to changing the line and changing the speed until I get the result that I want. Now there is one gotcha. If you come back and select an object, the settings come back up over here, but if you go in here and change the line setting, so let's change this from 0.01 to 0.005, and there doesn't appear to be any kind of an apply button. I can change that value, but if I go back over here and mark with the laser, it doesn't take effect. So I went back and forth changing this over and over and over again. You can see if I click away and then come back, it's still set to 0.01. What you actually have to do is hit enter in the text box, the window closes, and now that setting is changed. And presumably if you wanted to change more than one setting, you would have to open it up again, change another one, hit enter, it'll close and do them one at a time. But if you don't hit enter in there, and if you don't know to hit enter in there, you're gonna spend all day chasing your tail trying to figure out why your settings are not affecting the output. Now, I don't really wanna burn black boxes, I wanna burn things like logos. So I went over here to draw vector files, and this allows you to import vector files. Manual says it will handle Adobe Illustrator files, SVGs, and DXF, which is great. I have all of those. So I have my artwork as an Adobe Illustrator file, but if I try to load it, it just says unsupported vector file format. 
Okay, so I exported that as an SVG, and if I open that, it does something, but that is definitely not my logo. And I have messed around with some DXF files that I already had and exporting some new DXF files and finally new DXF exports from this Adobe Illustrator file appear to work. So there's my logo. I can move that around, resize it, and fill it. And this is a file that we will use for testing in this review video. Now, while I did get this to work, it was a very frustrating experience trying to figure this out by trial and error. Honestly, I would prefer to just use Lightburn. Lightburn does now support Galvo lasers, at least some Galvo lasers. I did contact support and they do not have configuration files or drivers to use Lightburn with the Atomstack M4. If they did, I would gladly pay the purchase price for Lightburn to be able to use it instead and actually have a good software experience. I think it ends up being about $150 for the Galvo license, and since the laser is about $1,500, that's an extra 10%. I would happily pay that to have a good user experience that uh, doesn't waste my time. I figured a good place to start the testing would be with cardboard, and I figured wrong. This isn't a material they list in the manual, and apparently this type of laser won't burn cardboard. So let's switch to something that they do recommend. These are painted aluminum cards. They actually included a little sample pack with the laser. So in this case, we're just blasting paint off of an aluminum card. And the results are really spectacular. It burns pretty fast and the contrast is really nice. It blows the paint off nice and clean. That is definitely a win. This is 3D printed ABS plastic. I decided to try this next and it leaves a kind of a nice dark, kind of a dark gray to black mark in the colored plastic. I tried this in some other colors of plastic. If you use really dark colors like black, it tends to leave a lighter gray or even kind of white bleached mark in it. Let's try a PC board, have some of these laying around. Figured this would be a good process for putting things like serial numbers and dates on them. And sure enough, it just blasts the solder mask right off of it nice and clean. This is mild steel. This I had to run a little bit slower. You can see the settings that I had here initially were just a little bit too fast, so it didn't mark it very darkly. Try again here, running slower and running the lines a little denser and closer together. And you can see it's leaving a much nicer dark mark. It's got some smudging around it, but turns out you can just rub that off with your thumb or a rag and it leaves a pretty nice mark. And this is something that the blue lasers couldn't do in mild steel. Let's try aluminum. That blue laser did nothing to aluminum. It just left it nice and shiny. Even the serre mark on it, it just blew the coating off and left no mark at all. The fiber laser, however, is etching into the surface. You can see some little flakes there of aluminum oxide that it's raising up, and it's actually leaving a mark. It's leaving a mark that's deep enough you can feel it. It's probably only a few thousandths, and under, the, under some lighting conditions, it's nice and white. Under other lighting conditions, it looks dark, but this leaves a really nice indelible mark in the aluminum. Let's try wood. Yeah, not so much. It's pretty much just like the cardboard, which really should be unsurprising. Here's an old favorite, the purple anodized aluminum handle that I found in the trash and have been using for testing lasers. Uh, unsurprisingly, the laser does a really good job with this. You can see the mark there on the left was done with the blue diode laser, and the marks on the right are done with the fiber laser. And it is leaving a very different kind of a mark. Instead of just bleaching out the dye, it's actually etching the surface, and you can feel it. It's a rough texture. It's a very different kind of a mark. The white is more pronounced, and I think the contrast is better. Let's try some copper. This I had to run a little bit slower than some of the other materials. The copper wicks away the heat, so you have to put more energy into it. But it is leaving a really nice dark mark. There's no real texture to it. It just feels smooth and you can buff it off if you use abrasives, but it makes a really beautiful dark colored mark in the material. I really like that. Okay, this is 6-4 titanium. 
This is something that I haven't tried marking with any other process, but this laser seems to be making short work of it. I do have to, again, run it a little slower to get a nice dark mark in it. And you can see it is raising up some flakes of what I assume are titanium oxides, but it leaves a pretty nice mark on there. It feels flush to the surface. I don't really feel any texture to it, but it leaves a very nice readable mark. Now, somebody told me that this laser uses red light, by which I think they meant infrared light, and therefore it was safe and wouldn't hurt you. I thought that was a bunch of baloney, so let's test it. This is a good quality all beef baloney from the deli counter, and sure enough, the laser doesn't touch it at all. Though I wouldn't consider this a conclusive safety test, I still recommend keeping your fingers out from under the frickin' laser. Let's try using it handheld. The small Chinese woman in the marketing literature makes this look easy. Turns out though, it's not easy. First of all, the shield doesn't really attach securely in any way. It's just loose on the lens, so you have to hold this with two hands. And the second problem is you can't really see the red border laser as it's painting the rectangle through the plastic shield. So getting this thing aligned is virtually impossible but I think I've got it lined up well enough and we'll give it a try anyway. So now all I have to do is hold this perfectly still. Which is harder than it looks. Uh, it twists side to side and it's also really easy to have it slide on the surface. The other problem that you can see is that the cone is filling up with smoke and that's a problem because it's occluding the laser. So as we get over to the end of the mark, it's not as pronounced as it was at the beginning. And you can see there's residue all over the inside of the cone after just a single logo. Now, just ignore the fact that I moved it multiple times and destroyed it. You can clearly see on the right-hand side at the top, that was the last part to engrave, and it is definitely faded due to the smoke occluding the laser. I really don't think this is practical at all. One thing that's interesting to note in this market is that there are some shenanigans going on. Call it sharing, call it borrowing, call it industrial incest, but there are multiple products on the market that share a lot of heritage. This laser is sold under the Atom Stack name, but when Tech Support sent me that cell phone video, you can clearly see the name Enjoywood marked on the side of the unit. I don't see an Enjoywood branded fiber laser currently for sale, but in the manual, there's a reference to Mr. Carve, which is another competing brand that you can buy. Are these all the same hardware and software? It's hard to tell, but this is probably a case where brand names are making it harder to identify products and not easier. So does the laser work? Yes, it does. Do I recommend it? No, not for most people, at least not yet. If, like me, you're the kind of person who throws away the manual and takes apart everything that you own, you will be able to get this to work. And it does indeed work. It does indeed mark the materials that they say it will mark. But if you're an artist or a crafter and you're looking to just drop some coin on a tool that will work right out of the box, this one probably isn't for you, at least not yet. My feedback to the manufacturer is you've got a solid product here with a lot of potential. There are three things that you need to do to make it great. You need to solve the manufacturing problems, change the geometry of the Galvo head mount so that it mounts squarely every time and stays square during shipping, train your tech support people so that when people contact you, they have a good experience, and three, support light burn. I mean, feel free to ship the free software with the laser. I guess that's something that you need to do, but give people the option to pay for a license and have a better experience with a better piece of software. Well, that's all I've got for today, but I would really like to hear from you. What do you think of this? Am I being too hard on it? Am I expecting too much from a $1,500 tool, or am I not expecting enough? Leave me a comment and let me know what you think. Thank you for watching.